We are ready to carve the neck. I use a simple homemade fixture to hold the neck while I carve. With other ways of holding the neck down, you run into problems, particularly with the clamps themselves getting in the way. I've also seen necks held in such a way as to cause undue stress to either the headstock joint or the fretboard tongue. At this stage, you don't want to break either. This fixture allows you to freely carve every part of the neck without ever having to remove it from the fixture. In fact, you can even check the feel of your neck as you go without removing it from the fixture. Furthermore, the position of the neck can easily be rearranged as you go to fit the task at hand, simply by adjusting how it is held in the vise. To make the fixture, I glued two 3 quarter inch boards together, then I cut it to this shape on the bandsaw. 3 8 of an inch dowels, or whatever size dowels that fit your tuner holes, are used to keep the headstock from shifting, and a heavy duty rubber band keeps pressure on the dowels. The bearing surfaces are padded with cork. It is important that the tenon, and maybe even a little bit of the heel, overhangs the bearing surface. That way, you don't put undue stress on the fretboard tongue when you carve. Two mini C-clamps and a padded call hold the fretboard tongue down. The dowels pass through the tuner holes and bear against the side of the fixture with the rubber band maintaining lateral pressure. Lateral or side to side pressure is all you need here to keep the neck from moving while you carve. Clamping with down pressure on the headstock is not only unnecessary, but you can easily snap the headstock that way. For the purpose of conceptually understanding the neck carving process, I break the neck down into five somewhat distinct parts. The heel, the shaft, the headstock, and what I call transition areas. There is a transition area between the heel and the shaft, and a transition area between the shaft and the headstock. Keep these areas in mind as you work. The goal, put simply, is to form the heel, the shaft, and the headstock and then blend those three areas together by working the transition areas. The headstock, of course, is already shaped, so we are partway there. The neck carving process is difficult to describe sequentially, as in saying, step one, do this, step two, do that. Rather, the process is fluid, with the carver jumping from one part of the neck to another, a strictly sequential understanding implies that the carver carves one area to completion before moving on to the next. And it just doesn't work that way. For example, as you contour the neck shaft, you will likely find that another area, such as the transition area next to the heel, starts to get in the way. So you jump over to that area to remove some of the bulk and smooth it out before returning to the shaft. Working one area informs how you work another. So rather than understanding the process as a set of steps, I think of it as a set of focal points or objectives. The best way to explain this is with an example. One of my focal points or objectives is to bring the sides of the neck flush with the fretboard. You will see me shift from working one part of the neck to another, and it may appear that I am working randomly. However, my focus is still on bringing the sides of the neck flush with the fretboard and everything I do, I am doing in order to reach that objective. 
As you see here, the focal point or objective will be shown in the top left screen so you don't get lost. One more concept to understand before we get started. The fretboard and the heel cap are what I call our hard points. The entire neck is carved using these hard points as a guide. We are not shaping the fretboard or the heel cap anymore at this point. Conversely, the fretboard will be shaping the neck shaft and the heel cap will be shaping the heel. This will make more sense as we get into it. I keep a large variety of rasps and files on hand while neck carving, but I mostly use the Shinto rasp and the rat tail rasp. All the other rasps and files come in handy in certain places, but ultimately I could do without them. It's a good idea, however, to also have a set of needle files for fine work around the transition area between the headstock and shaft. You could also use a spoke shave in place of the rasps for heavy removal. Other tools that I use include the coping saw, some flat files, rat tail files, razor blades, a thumb plane, and flat sanding blocks. You can also consider using card scrapers instead of files. Now to get started, I first mark out the outline for the heel. I simply draw a straight line between the fretboard and the heel cap. Remember, those points are our hard points and they determine the shape of the heel. Everything outside of these lines will be removed. As you can see, that's a lot of material to remove. Since there is so much excess material here, I simply cut away the bulk of it now with a coping saw. Notice how I'm still a good eighth of an inch off of the line for the heel and off of the fretboard. There's no need to get close to our marks just yet. And the same thing on the other side. Now to set the taper of the shaft. I mark where the center of the first fret space and the center of the ninth fret space is on the neck. At each point I will file a trough to a different depth. The difference between the two depths determines the taper of the neck from nut to heel. I use my rat tail rasp to file a trough at the first fret space mark. I file this down until the thickness of the neck and fretboard at this location is 23.5 millimeters. I use a thickness caliper to check the measurement. At the ninth fret space, I file down until the thickness caliper reads 25.5 millimeters. My real target measurements are actually 23 and 25 millimeters, but I add the 0.5 to each to account for the extra material you may lose when smoothing everything out at the end. Also keep in mind that the actual thickness of my neck in the very end, when the guitar is complete, will be closer to 22 millimeters at the nut and 24 millimeters at the heel. This is because, as you may recall, the fretboard is still unradiused and oversized so we will not reach the true thickness until a later lesson when we radius and level the fretboard. All of my parameters are set and I'm ready to carve. It is very important to protect the headstock from the follow through of your tools. I like to use the E-string dowels as a sort of barrier to prevent me from marring my headstock shape with an overzealous stroke. So now my objective is to bring the sides of the neck flush with the fretboard. 
there's a lot of material in the way, so I start by rounding or beveling the edge to get that material out of the way. After a while, I notice that the bulk of the heel starts to get in the way, so I switch to rounding out that area with a rat tail rasp. I also round over some material in the headstock transition area. With some of that material now out of the way, I can return to the rounding over of the shaft. The Shinto rasp works very well in large open areas like the shaft, but not in the tight areas of the heel and headstock transition areas. A round tool like the rat tail rasp works better in those areas. Now you can see that I've rounded the neck to the point that just a narrow strip of flat material hangs out at the edge. This is the material that we want to bring in flush with the fretboard, and now that I've reduced it to a narrow strip, I can attack it with the thumb plane. As you work to bring this flush, you may find that this flat plane becomes too wide again. This simply means that I need to round over the shaft more to get more material out of the way before returning with the thumb plane at the edge once again. When the side is very close to flush, I switch to using a razor blade that I've sharpened into a mini scraper. This brings it the rest of the way flush. Okay, the right side is flush with the fretboard. Now I do the same thing on the other side. Now both sides of the neck are flush with the fretboard. Now I bring the area immediately below the heel cap flush with the heel cap. I start by focusing just on the back edge of the heel. I can very carefully and precisely bring this area flush with a flat needle file. I won't use a cutting tool such as a chisel here on the edge because on the edge it's easy for the tool to tear out a chunk.
Now I can trim around the front of the heel cap with a chisel. I register the back of the chisel against the heel cap and remove about an eighth of an inch all the way around. Notice that now the neck is flush both around the heel cap and near the fretboard, leaving a mound of material between these two points. Now I am going to level that material down to the line on both sides, so that the heel runs in a straight line from the heel cap to the fretboard. Here I am using a thumb plane to remove the bulk of the material, but then I switch to a flat 80 grit sanding block as I get closer. I stop to round over and remove some of the material around the front of the heel, just because it's getting in the way. The left side looks good. Let's do the right side. Okay, so this is where the bulk of the heavy carving takes place. We are going to focus on contouring the shaft until the depth marks disappear. The troughs that we cut earlier to 23.5 and 25.5 millimeters will slowly close up as we carve on both sides of the shaft. Watching how the troughs close up gives a good indication of whether or not both sides are being contoured evenly. As you progress, you want to see the troughs turn into ovals and eventually small circles at the center of the next width. If the oval or circle appears to be favoring one side or the other, then your carving is uneven. I frequently reverse the fixture in the vise so that I can blend strokes from both directions. Also, as you pro progress, you will notice that the transition areas of the headstock and the heel start to get in the way, so I frequently return to those areas to remove material and begin to blend them in, all the while maintaining my focus on the primary objective, which is making those depth marks disappear. I check the feel of the neck as I go. Another way to check your work and find any low spots that may be imperceptible to the eye is to mark up the entire shaft with pencil and then sand away the marks with 80 grit sandpaper held taut at the sides. Because the sandpaper is held taut at the sides, it can only remove material at the high spots. Thus, the low spots reveal themselves where the pencil marks remain. I sand until all the pencil marks are gone and then I return to removing material with the rasps and files. As I get closer to the point where the depth marks disappear, I alternate between heavy removal with rasps and files and sanding things level with 80 grit sandpaper. Rasps, rasps and files remove wood quickly while the sandpaper removes the inconsistencies and the high spots that come from using rasps and files. The depth marks are nearly gone at this point. I like to switch my focus to further blending in the transition areas at this time. As I blend in the transition areas, 
I continue to punctuate the process with occasional sandings with the 80 grit paper. The long strokes of the sandpaper help to blend in the work I'm doing at the transition areas. The idea is that by the time I've blended in the transition areas, the depth marks will be gone. So the process looks something like this. I sand the shaft a little bit using long strokes to blend the shaft with the transition areas. Then maybe I blend the heel transition area either with a rasp or a file depending on how much I want to remove. Once that's progressed a little bit, I'll skip over to the headstock transition area. Here I'm flattening the bulge in the transition area to match the plane of the back of the headstock. Once the bulge here is mostly level, a flat wide sanding block is useful to blend the transition area in with the plane of the back of the headstock. Then I return to blending the shaft with the transition areas using long strokes of the sandpaper. And the cycle repeats like that until both of the transition areas are blended in with the rest of the neck and the depth marks are gone. Okay, the depth marks are gone, the transition areas are blended, and the neck looks pretty good. I consider neck carving complete at this point, although I usually touch up certain areas later after the neck is attached. Remember, the fretboard is still oversized, so if the neck feels a little bulky in your hands, that's okay for now. I zero in on the neck feel after the neck is attached and the fretboard is leveled and radiused. Thank mm -hmm. you.